عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is the second part of the مصطلح الحديث class or series the science of hadith series Alhamdulillah the first part was very good and uh, generally speaking most of those who are with us you did well I know maybe some of you are still waiting to, to get your um, exam papers but you did well you did well and those brothers and sisters who are not with us the recordings are available on the site if you go to the Abu Huraira website abuhuraira.org you will see the small icon which says live broadcast live broadcast or on top where it says videos or something like that multimedia you click on the video archive when you go there you'll see so many icons the one which says the science of hadith you'll see all the lectures there it is very very important for you to understand this class to go back to those those videos very important because it is all one class like we said before it is all one class there's some terminologies we'll be using here those who are with us they'll get it right away to click alhamdulillah those who are not or those who haven't read the book then you might find some trouble you have a book now alhamdulillah you have the videos they're there for free it's just you i'm putting your tab but i strongly advise you have to you have to do that so we, we carry on we took a month break exactly a month if i'm not wrong one month we stopped on march what fourth or fifth fifth march fifth we stopped yes thursday march fifth sixth seventh eighth yes now we're back on april second april second the sheikh now we finished the terminology that is one thing I have to tell. The terminology of the different types of hadith, the hadith themselves, we categorize them, different types of transmission, different types of how they were narrated, who the, uh, the narrations they go to. We finished all of that. Now, this course or this class now, it is mainly about the books of hadith these books which is very very important for a Muslim and very shameful for one who does not know to be honest that our religion which we are proud of Alhamdulillah Allah guided us to Islam the right religion where do you get your religion what are the sources of this religion see that's the difference between the truth and falsehood falsehood whatever the priest decides today Whatever the priest comes and says, I had a dream. And God the Father or God the Son, he said this and that. Then the flock, they follow. Islam, you cannot have that. Because it's the truth. The truth has sources. Unchanged, unadulterated sources. Complete, perfect. The Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran, all of us know it. Everyone has a copy of the Quran in his house or her house. Maybe with translation. But the Sunnah most Muslims are um, heedless of the Sunnah some they don't even know um, any book of the Sunnah some they know the basic they say okay there's Bukhari and Muslim but Bukhari and Muslim they only have maybe 20% or 25% of all the Hadith that's the reality what about the other books there's many many Hadith as much as those which are in Bukhari Muslim, which are not in Bukhari Muslim. So it is very important to at least know these books, know who are the authors, know what they are about, how are they different. And inshallah, I just had the, the idea of maybe after finishing this, we go to the other fields of knowledge. What are the main books of Tafsir? What are the main books of Fiqh in the different madhabs? What are the main books of the Hanafis or the Hanbalis or the, uh, the Shafi'is? What are the main books of Sirah? What are the main books? That is something every Muslim, I think, should know. Every Muslim should, should uh, uh, know. 
So we finished the terminology. Now we're going into the books of Hadith. What makes Bukhari's book different from Abu Dawood's? What makes an Nasa'i's book different from Ahmad? Why do we say Bukhari is all authentic and all acceptable? Why not the Sunan of Ibn Majah? Things like those. Things like those. And who are these people? Who is Bukhari Muslim? People who are just here. What about, do we know anything about them? This is what we're all going to discuss, inshallah, in the next coming um, uh, weeks. And we have to know that Ramadan is close, getting close. Ramadan is how many weeks away? Now? MashaAllah, 89 days? So how many weeks are those? No? It's not eight, it's 12 weeks. 12 weeks. 12 weeks, that's not many. That is not many. How many paychecks are those? Six. Those are six paychecks. So you look forward, count it by checks. By your paychecks, then you will come closer. You know, when you count by paychecks, it seems closer and closer. You're always waiting for it, right? That's how we should wait for Ramadan. 12 weeks are not many, by the way. So we will be done before that. And as usual, before Ramadan, we have the Ramadan preparation classes, which this year, I think, will only do one, just one for everybody. But for you, those who are studying the science of hadith, we'll do like three or four. Thinking of doing the book of fasting, book of fasting in Sahih al-Bukhari. So we can go in detail with the narrators and all of that. Because now you are learning. And it's just ideas. It's just ideas. Now the Sheikh first he tells us about the Sahaba. We now are talking about the books of Hadith. We have known the books of Hadith, they did not come down as revelation. Meaning Allah did not send a book, Sahih al-Bukhar. Allah did not send a book, Sunan Abu Dawood. Right? Allah did not send a book like that. It came to the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet, he taught people. From those people, other people came and other people came and other people came until we are here now. Or at least until those books were written, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, to the end. Who are the people who narrated those books? Who are the people who took that knowledge from the Prophet sallallahu Then those from those and those from those. These are called the tabaqat. Tabaqat. Levels or generations. We mentioned something about this before. The Sheikh is going briefly through the generations until you reach the generation of those who wrote the books. It's important. Like I mentioned before, knowing this is also very essential in answering those people who want to discredit the Sunnah. Saying, oh, the Sunnah was just men, just human beings, they wrote this hadith so many years after the Prophet. We say what? The same people who wrote the Sunnah are the same people who wrote the Quran. The same people who transmitted the Sunnah are the same people who transmitted the Quran. So if you are to discredit the Sunnah, you have to discredit the Quran also. You have to. There's no way. Right? So it's very important to know the generations. And from the generations, um, the outstanding personalities not all of them not all of them but those who are outstanding those whom you should know remember every nation has its majesty through its history every nation every nation whether secular or religious you are proud of the pioneers everybody is proud of their pioneers You'll find people, they name their streets or their hospitals or their schools by the name of the, the pioneers. Islam, we had pioneers also. People who are Muslims before us. People who are better Muslims before us. Especially the first three generations whom the Prophet ﷺ praised. When he said those are the best. Do we know anything about them? The Sahaba? The companions who, are, who lived with the Prophet and they saw him. 
than those who came after the Sahaba. They did not see the Prophet, but they saw the people who saw the Prophet, the Sahaba. And then, those are the Tabi'in, they're called. Then the Atba'u Tabi'in, the followers of the Tabi'in. They saw the people who saw the Sahaba of the Prophet. The first three generations. So how many years are those? Now, how many years are those, the first three generations? 300? Who says 300? Who says 300? First three generations. Nobody says 300. Why not? Why not 300? Abu Fatah. Ah, we mentioned this before. A generation, then a century. Generation does not mean century. The common idea when you hear first generation, second generation, we automatically think most of us 100 years, 100 years, 100 years. It's not true. Because if you count 100 years, to, that will be to 300. Well, 300 then Malik, also, uh, sorry, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Ahmad, all of them will be Atba'u Tabi'in. Well, they are not. The first three generations is around 150 years. Around 150. And we say the good example is, look at yourself. When was your grandfather, when did your grandfather die, Muhammad? Before you were born, exactly. When? In the 60s. Then your father was born, and then you were still alive, alhamdulillah. When was he born, approximately? Your grandfather. Early 1900s? Now we're in 2000 and what? 14. So that's 114 years and you have three generations. You see that? And everyone here is like that unless you are very old and your father lived very long age, alhamdulillah, and your grandfather lived very long age, then it stretches out. Even if it stretches out, it's not 100, 100, 100. So that's the point. So the point is we have to know these personalities. We have to know these personalities. And the first generation, the best, which took the knowledge from the Prophet وسلم, are the Sahaba. The Sahaba. Now I have to mention something, ya Ikhwan. Most of us here, we are not Arabs. The Arabs are few, Jazakallah khair. The Arabs are few. In English, the Sahaba, we translate as companions. The companions, the friends. When we transliterate, we write Sahaba the way you see it in your book or on the screen. A S S A H A B. So we read a Sahaba. What is the Sahaba in Arabic? No, what is the Sahaba? Sahaba is the clouds. Sahaba is the clouds. Swahaba with Swad, Swad. That is the Sahaba, the companions. Swahib is a companion, a friend with Swad. Sahaba with Sin, Sahaba are the clouds. It's very important to learn Arabic. One letter changes you from human beings all the way to compressed, condensed gases or whatever the clouds are made of. What are clouds made of? Gas? So we can see gas? Huh? Is it water vapor? No, water vapor goes into the clouds. Then it comes down our strength. What are the clouds made of? Can you walk on a cloud? You can't. Does it have mass? It has It has? How? Why? Okay, leave the physics guys, please. Leave it to the experts. I'm not an expert. But I always wondered, especially when I'm flying on a plane, I always wonder, subhanAllah, look at the clouds. 
Because when you look from above, just like pieces of, I don't know, pieces of things which are just lying there and they are under you. But when the plane goes into the clouds, there's turbulence. Of course, they have mass, you know. But at the same time, can you hold a cloud? I always wondered that. Maybe we should go sometime and try to hold a cloud. Bring it back to Abu Hurair. I brought clouds from the sky of Toronto. Can you do that? Has anyone tried that? I don't think you can. You can't. You can? You can't touch it. I'll look into that. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Google, inshallah. Anyway, the Sahaba, Swad, Swad, Sahaba, those are the companions. Okay? One is Swahib, Swahib, companion, Sahaba, companions. He says, the definition of a Sahaba. Remember, every hadith has two parts, right or wrong. What are the two parts of a hadith? The Isnad and the Matn. The chain of people narrating the hadith and then the text of hadith. So you have to learn about the different people who narrated the hadith, the different generations. And the most top of them is the Sahaba because they took from the Prophet. Who is a Sahabi? How does someone qualify to be called a Sahaba? He says, this is an individual who met the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or saw him and believed in him and his message and then died upon that belief. It is someone who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is number one, first condition. He saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Second, he believed in the Prophet and the message of the Prophet, meaning he believed in Islam. And three, this person after seeing the Prophet and he is a Muslim and then he died upon Islam. Meaning he did not change his religion. This person, he is called or he is now one of the companions of the Prophet He saw the Prophet. He believed in the Prophet. And he died as a Muslim. Three conditions. First condition is what? He saw the Prophet So me and you, do we fulfill that first condition? No, we didn't see the Prophet. Second condition is what? We believed in the we believe in the Prophet. Do we believe? Yes. And we died upon Islam. We ask Allah to make us die upon Islam. Even if you do that, do, are we called Sahabis? No, because we never saw the Prophet. So we are out. And Bukhari is out and Ahmad Abu Hanifa Mal, they're all out. Only the generation which saw him. So even someone who existed in, uh, in Canada when the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina or Mecca. And the message reached him somehow, and he believed he became a Muslim. But he never saw the Prophet, even though he lives in the same time as the Prophet. Is he a Sahabi? No. Very important. Because he never saw the Prophet. Okay, second condition, he believed in him. So let's say someone saw the Prophet, but never believed in him. Like Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, all those kuffar, they saw the Prophet, they knew him. But they never believed in him. In fact, they used to fight him. Are they Sahabis? No. Third condition, and then died upon Islam. So someone saw the Prophet, and he was a Muslim, but then, waliyadhan billah, he changed his religion. And died upon a religion other than Islam. This person is a Sahabi? No. You understand? So, this is very important. What about some, someone who saw the Prophet but did not believe in him? He did not believe in the Prophet. Yeah, he did not believe in the Prophet Then the Prophet died Then after the Prophet died, this man now entered into Islam. And then this man, Alhamdulillah, he died upon Islam. Is he a Sahabi? He saw the Prophet. Maybe he heard the Prophet ﷺ saying something. But he was a Mushrik. He was not Muslim. 
and did not believe until the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And the Prophet passed away, he believed. And he died upon Islam. Is this person a Sahabi? If he narrates hadith, do you accept the hadith to be direct from the Sahaba, from the Prophet ﷺ? Who says yes? You say yes. You say yes. Why yes? Huh? The scholars, before I mention what the scholars have judged, who says no? Most of you said no. Who says no? Why no? Why? So he wasn't Muslim at the time when he heard that hadith. So maybe he made it, he made it up. Maybe he heard it in a wrong way. Right? That's possible. Okay, the scholars have said, the hadith which he is going to narrate after he has become Muslim, after he took his shahada, we accept them. Because now he is a Muslim. While the things he said when he was still a mushrik, things he said about the Prophet, you don't accept them because you don't accept the riwaya of a, of a kafir. You understand? What about this other case? Someone who saw the Prophet ﷺ and believed in him. Then he changed his religion. He says, I don't want Islam anymore. And he became Christian, Jew, Sikh, Hindu, whatever he became. And then he came back to Islam after. After the Prophet ﷺ had died. And he died upon Islam. Do we accept his hadith? After he came back to Islam, do we accept his hadith? This guy left the religion. Yes, he died upon Islam. When he left the religion, he did not give any hadith. He was fighting Islam, in fact. Then he came back to be a good Muslim. And he died upon Islam. Now when he came back to be a good Muslim, he used to give hadith of the Prophet. Because he met the Prophet. Do you accept those hadith? Is he called a Sahabi? Huh? No? No? Yes, he is a Sahaba because he saw the Prophet. These are the conditions. Listen, someone who saw the Prophet believed in him, and then this person died upon Islam at the end. Whatever he did in between is between him and Allah. He is a Sahabi. Like the Bedouin who comes from the desert. There's so many hadith like that, right? Someone from the desert, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu only one time. And he said to the prayer, Rasulullah, tell me what's going to take me to Jannah. And the Prophet Sallallahu tells him, you believe in Allah, that is the only true God deserves to be worshipped. And you pray your salahs and you give your zakah and you go for hajj if you can in first Ramadan. And then this man, he goes away, he says, Allah, he'll not increase on that. That is enough. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you do that, he's going to Jannah. Then he leaves. This man, he never meets the Prophet Sallallahu anymore again. He goes back to his desert and he dies upon Islam. Is he a Sahabi? He saw the Prophet only for five minutes. Is he a Sahaba? Of course, if he fulfills the conditions, that is another point. The scholars they say, whoever saw the Prophet, وسلم, even for one moment, he just saw him. He is a Sahabi. And of course, he believed in him and died upon Islam. But of course, that Bedouin. Is he going to be the same as Abu Bakr? Obviously not. But of course, he's a Sahabi as he's a Sahabi. We'll leave the questions to the end. So this is the definition of a Sahabi, a companion of the Prophet Someone who met the Prophet he saw him. Now here they say he saw him. If you read the books of Arab uh, in Arabic, the books of Hadith they say, Man, Whoever saw the Prophet. So what if someone was blind? He never saw the Prophet. He never saw the Prophet. But he believed in him and he died upon Islam. Is he a Sahabi? Of course he's a Sahabi. It doesn't mean literally have to see by the eyes anyone who met the Prophet. What if, what if someone was, was deaf? 
he saw the Prophet Sallallahu but he cannot hear anything. He believed in him, but some of the Sahabas, they gave him the hadith by writing. And when this person narrates hadith, do we say this hadith is authentic from the Prophet? Yes, he's a Sahab. It doesn't mean literally see whoever met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam believed in him and died upon Islam and died upon Islam the Sheikh he says that so a man who embraced Islam during the lifetime of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and met him but later apostates from the religion and then repents and accepts Islam again and dies upon the religion and then re, uh, and dies upon the religion of Islam is a companion example al ashath ibn Qais this happened I, I was not just giving you um, a hypothetical example this happened someone who met the Prophet Sallam, saw him believed in him and then he apostatized and then he came back to Islam and died upon Islam example of ashath ibn Qais is he Sahabi? yes in fact, worse than that, the example of who knows the name of the Sahabi? I just, I just, I just had it in my mind. Was it Tuleha? Tuleha. He saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi He believed in him, and then he changed his religion. Not only that, after changing the religion, he says, "I am a prophet." He says, "I am a prophet." Then he goes. After the Prophet Sallallahu he passed away, he repented, he came back to Islam, and he died as a shaheed. He's a Sahabi. He's a Sahabi. Time? This happened. It's happened. So the Sheikh says, as long as he saw the Prophet Sallallahu accepted Islam, and finally died upon Islam, he's a Sahabi. However, a person who embraced Islam during the lifetime of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but did not meet him he did not meet the Prophet such an individual is not considered a companion example an Najashi the king of Abyssin the king of Ethiopia when the Muslims migrated the first migration to Habasha to Abyssinia Ethiopia an Najashi believed but he used to hide his Iman but he believed but he never met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but he believed he is considered a Sahabi no because he never saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he never met him even that was during the same time he says likewise a person who embraces Islam and met the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but later apostated and then died upon that other religion he is not called a Sahabi someone who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then changes his religion after after having after having been a Muslim and then died upon that other religion this person is not called a Sahabi and there's I don't think there's any example of that I don't think there's any example of that except of the Munafiqun and the other people there are people like that who apostatize actually there are examples but particular names we don't know of particular names I don't know but there are people who apostatized after having had belief. After belief, they changed the religion. There are people like that. When the Prophet ﷺ was taken for the night journey, Isra al-Mi'raj, up to the seventh heaven, when he came back, other people, they could not believe that. They changed the religion. This happened. This happened. Time. So these people, they're not called Sahabis because they died upon other religion other than Islam. He says, example, Abdullah ibn Khalaf, Rabi'a ibn Umayyah, who apostated during the reign of Umar ibn Khattab and died upon his disbelief. Actually, we have examples. So, the Shaykh says, that is the definition of the Sahaba. Someone who saw the, pro he saw the Prophet, believed in him, and died upon Islam. The numbers of the companions are too many to give an accurate figure of all of them. Although it has been estimated that there were around 114,000. Those who fulfilled these conditions. Those who saw the Prophet ﷺ, believed in him and died upon Islam. 
They say 114. Others say 140,000. Okay? Around there. Nobody has exact numbers. Nobody has exact numbers. But most of them, especially those who narrated hadith of the Prophet, all of them we have their biographies. All of them, we have their biographies. If you go to Sierra Alam Nubala, and there's actually sp books which are specially written just for the Sahaba, biographies of the Sahaba. Books which are written just for the biographies of the Sahaba. Like, which book? Huh? No, no. Books, when I say books, books. 20 volumes, 14 volumes. We have Al-Isaba. Al-Tamiz is Sahaba. Al-Isaba of Ibn Hajar. And other books. There's the book of Ibn Abdul Bar. There's special books. There's the book of uh, al baghawi Special books just on the Sahaba. Just on the Sahaba. So 114,000 around there. Now, what is the status of a companion in Islam? What is the status of the companion? He says, especially now we're talking about hadith. All the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were thiqa and adl. What does thiqa mean? Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Is it trustworthy? Is it trustworthy? Those of you who are with us before. Does thiqa mean trustworthy only? No. Huh? It means also the memory was good in the narration. They were trustworthy in the narration. Yes, they won't lie. But they are also good in their memory. Meaning they transmitted the way they learned. That's what thiqa means. It's more than just being trustworthy. But in English, if you read any book, mostly is translated as trustworthy. All the Sahaba, they were thiqa and adl. They were just. What is adl? What is adala? What is adala? Don't tell, don't tell me just. I have that in my book also. Huh? They are credible. Well, how did we define it though? They are credible in their, in their deen and their muru, their manners. They're credible in their deen and their manners. And those are the conditions for a narration to be accepted from someone. He has to be trustworthy, reliable in his memory, and he has to be someone of good deen. So our belief, in fact, this is part of aqidah, not just hadith. That's why any book of aqidah you read, this point has to be mentioned. Our belief as Ahlul Sunnah, all of the Sahaba, they are thiqatun udul. They are all reliable and just people. They will never lie on the Prophet So their hadith are all accepted. He says, the narration reported by any one of them, the narration reported by any one of them is accepted without question. Even if he's unknown. Even if he's unknown. Meaning, what does he mean if he's unknown? If someone from the Tabi'in, he says, one of the men of the Ansar, or one of the men of the Muhajirun, one of the men who, from the Sahaba, his name is Abdullah ibn Fulan, he told me that the Prophet said this and that. Even though maybe this is one of those Sahabis who are not so famous. Maybe it's not from the famous ones. We accept the Hadith. We accept the hadith. Unlike everybody else who came after. Everybody else, we have to know when he was born, where he was born, who are his sheikhs, who narrated from him, was he trustworthy, how was his deen? The Sahaba, once he's a Sahaba, he has that already. He has that already. That is why we said when we gave the definition of hadith mursal. What is hadith mursal? Huh? Hadith Mursal is when a tabi'i, someone who never saw the Prophet, he skips the Sahaba and says, the Prophet said this and that. We said that hadith is not accepted. 
because this person never saw the prophet he dropped the sahaba right what about the mursal of the sahaba meaning a sahaba like aisha says the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got married to khadija when she was 40 years khadija and aisha never met khadija radhi anha maybe when she died aisha was not even born this hadith of aisha is it accepted yes because aisha definitely is narrating from one of the sahaba who met khadija or he's she's narrating directly from the prophet so the Sahaba, the narrations are accepted. Even if we know they were not there because they're all thikat and udul. But anybody else below them? No. He says thus, an unknown companion is not taken as a defect when establishing the authenticity of a hadith. The reasons for this principle are cited below. Why do we say this? Why do we say all the Sahaba are thikat and udul? Trustworthy and reliable and just, accepted. Because Allah says in the Quran, we have evidences from the Quran and evidences from the Sunnah. Allah says, "Wasabiqun al-awwalun min al-muhajirin wal-ansar wal-ladina taba'uhum bi-ihsan radhi Allahu anhum radhu anhu." And the foremost to embrace Islam from the muhajirun and the ansar and those who follow them after them, Allah is pleased with them and they are with Him. Allah will not be pleased with people whom he knows they're going to lie on his prophet. Impossible. And Allah will not choose them to be the companions and then they come to lie. Impossible. Allah chose those people because he knew then these people they will take the knowledge from the prophet and spread it to the rest of the world. As you will see later on, some of them went to Basra, some of them went to Baghdad, some of them went to uh, Iraq and uh, other parts, some of them went to Khurasan, some of them went to Sham. Some of them went to Africa. It is said some of them even went to India. There was no Pakistan, so don't ask me. It was all India. Okay, don't ask me. What about Bangladesh? There was no Bangladesh. It was all India. Don't ask me. What about Russia? There was no Russia. It was all Khurasan and Azerbaijan, whatever. Don't ask me. What about Lebanon? There was no Lebanon. It's all Sham. Don't ask me about Somalia, Hargesa. There was no Somalia. It was all Africa, Habash. In fact, the, 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 the scholars of, of Tariq, they say all of that Somalia and Sudan, the areas of Kenya, Ethiopia, was all called Habash. It was all one kingdom. So anyways, the Sahaba, they spread. They spread. Allah chose them. So they were not going to be people who were going to, to lie. And evidence is from the Sunnah. So we finish off for Salah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, the best generation of my ummah is my generation. And then those who came after, and then those who came after. This is enough of a proof that they are trustworthy. Another proof to show that the Sahaba, they are all thiqat and udul, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas, who said, a Bedouin came to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A Bedouin. What was the name of this Bedouin? Nobody knows. But he was a Bedouin who saw the Prophet, believed in the Prophet. So he's a Sahabi. He came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when they were looking for the moon of Ramadan. And he said, Inni qad ra'aytu hilal. I saw the moon. I saw the crescent. I saw the new moon. The Prophet Sallallahu asked him, because he does not know him, he says to him, Atashhadu an la ilaha illallah anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Do you say, do you testify that there is none who has the right to be worshipped except Allah, and that I am the messenger of Allah? Are you a Muslim real? He says, yes. The Prophet Sallallahu then asked, do you testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? He says, yes. The Prophet Sallallahu then said, Ya Bilal, O Bilal, announce to the people that they are fasting tomorrow. Announce to the people that they are fasting tomorrow. So the narration of this one Sahaba, who is a Bedouin, but is a Muslim, it is accepted, showing that the Sahaba, what about Abu Bakr? What about Umar? What about Ali, Uthman? What about those? Automatically. 
all of these are proofs that the narrations of the Sahaba, all of them, you don't have to go and check the biography of the Sahaba. Those of the, us before, we said there's special books written about the narratives of hadith, so and so. The scholars they mention is they accepted or not, right or wrong. The books of Jarha Ta'adil. The Sahaba know. We have their biographies, not because we want to know are their narrations accepted or not. No, we just have their biographies to know them. That's the difference. All of the narrations are accepted. All of them. All of them. The Sahaba are the best. And if you are to give more and more proofs, there's enough. We'll give a whole lecture. And we, I gave a khutbah or two khutbahs. If you go to the Abu Huraira website, you'll find those khutbahs. The status of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So this is the status. This is the status. So the Shaykh says, the following points can be obtained from the above hadith. Number one, a person who meets the Prophet of Allah ﷺ and believes in Islam is a companion, like we mentioned. He meets the Prophet and he believes in Islam. He is a companion. Number two, once the Messenger of Allah ﷺ knew of the person's acceptance of Islam, he neglected to inquire about his condition, not even his name. Because he knows this person cannot be lying. And number three, the narration of a single trustworthy and just person is acceptable. What kind of narration is that? The narration where there's only one person. Hadith, Hadith Gharib. Hadith Ghari, where there's only one person. So I will stop here and come back after Salat al Maghrib, insha'Allah. Subhanakallahumma bhamdik shadu la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa tubi.